From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. President Biden and Democrats have spent the week touting the first anniversary of the Inflation Reduction Act. Clearly, they think this is a political winner going into 2024. We'll talk about their political calculation as well as about how the Inflation Reduction Act is turning out in the real economy as it is, in fact, likely to become a major issue in 2024. Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo with the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal and here with my colleagues, Kim Strassel and Alicia Finley, who have been following this political and policy debate from the start. Welcome to you both. The IRA, as it's called, passed a year ago when Joe Manchin, West Virginia Democrat, decided to change his mind and support the bill. It passed on a strictly party line vote using reconciliation procedures that allowed it to pass with a simple 50-vote majority in the Senate, along with a tie-breaking vote by Vice President Kamala Harris. That sets the stage for the political fight over its impact and whether it is working or not for the economy and the American public. Let's listen to President Biden talk Wednesday at the White House about the IRA. It's taking the most aggressive action ever on climate energy, ever. I've long said, and I've, that's why I think all the unions have come along. I've long said, when I think climate, not a joke, I think jobs. I think jobs. <laughs> Republicans have repeatedly tried to repeal key parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, including the Speaker of the House now, taking credit for the billions of dollars in private investments and thousands of jobs coming into their states. That's okay. I ran for president, and I said I represent all Americans. And like I said in the State of the Union, I'll see you at the groundbreaking. All right, Alicia, jobs, jobs and jobs and more jobs. That's what he thinks about when he sees the IRA. Let's talk about the elements of the bill and, and how it's actually working. First, let's talk about the bill called the Inflation Reduction Act. Is it reducing inflation? <laughs> I don't even think any of uh, the Democrats or even those on the left say that that is the reason that inflation is coming down. I mean, it was really a misnomer they want to take past this bill. So they invented the Inflation Reduction Act as a name to try to build public support for it. When, in fact, it really was just a blowout climate spending bill with some, you know, Medicare price controls added on. And I think the bill was estimated to cost about $369 billion at the time. And now more independent analysis have found that it's probably going to cost upward of $1.2 trillion, possibly even $3 trillion over the next decade, depending on how many companies cash in on all the subsidies. And why the discrepancy between the original estimates now and the Goldman Sachs estimates, which I think is $1.2 trillion, and these other estimates? Well, the CBO, I think... Congressional Budget Office. The Congressional Office. Budget Office didn't understand or expect how many companies would try to exploit these tax credits. These are open-ended subsidies, so there isn't a cap or appropriations cap like there typically is for grants in budget bills. So all of a sudden you've got this rush of companies. Essentially, it's a green rush and they're trying to exploit these tax credits. And then there's also the added incentive because of this alternative minimum tax that was also thrown into the bill that these tax credits are actually exempt from this alternative minimum tax. So companies have an all the more incentive to try to capitalize on these tax credits. I see. So the open-ended nature of it, plus the incentives to to take more, otherwise you get punished. It's interesting, I would point out, the head of the Congressional Budget Office uh, says, that wasn't us, that was the Joint Tax Committee. We didn't make that <laughs> estimate. Oh. That's, uh, you know, look, ma, no hands. We did mention the number that Joint Tax and push it as part of our estimate of the cost, but that wasn't us, that was those other guys, <laughs> which is amusing as government works. Kim, let's talk about this jobs question. I mean, obviously, this goes back when it comes to green energy to the Obama presidency, where the presidency talked about green jobs. That's been the selling point of green energy subsidies. And there's no question that some new jobs will be created as part of this. When you throw subsidies of this magnitude at industries, you'll get more of what you subsidize. But when he says the unions are on board here, he's not really entirely accurate. There's some real tension there with some of the unions like the United Auto Workers. Oh, lots of tension because a number of these projects are 
displacing those traditional blue-collar union workers. We have had a number of layoffs in different automakers, including at Ford, because these companies are making very distorted investment decisions at the moment. They're not going with cars that people actually want to buy. This is causing up upheaval and huge losses. And so you're ending up seeing UAW workers and others get hit because of that. You've got a lot of different workers in, in other blue collar sectors who, you know, they might be working in the fossil fuel industry. They might be working to ship different products that now are considered toxic, according to the administration. So that's pulling jobs away from them. And as you say, there might be some temporary short-term ones, for instance, in the construction that you are seeing out there that is being spurred on by these subsidies and investments. But the thing is, is that's potentially fleeting. Are these projects that are being subsidized by the taxpayers at Biden's demand, are they going to be profitable in the long run, given that they're basically being created by government, not by demand, and that there's a lot of misallocation of capital going on here? And so, yeah, there's a lot of pain that's being felt right now by traditional workers and traditional industries, as this administration essentially attempts to force a transition to new areas that may or may not be successful. West Virginia, for one state has about 100,000 jobs that depend on fossil fuels. Ohio, 300,000 jobs, Alicia, that depend on fossil fuels. Uh, To the extent that those jobs are targeted here for replacement by the investments in green energy, that is going to be a transition cost in jobs. A transition cost sounds like such a abstraction, but these are human beings who will be pushed out of work. And, you know, the economy is constantly changing. So whether or not there are subsidies, but when it's forced by government, And as Kim says, we don't know if there will be a demand for these trucks at the price that they will be willing or able to sell them. Well, I think that's right. And you're already seeing it. Ford has announced it's throttling back its production goals and targets because of... For EVs? For EVs, because of ebbing demand. GM has been very slow walking its productions of EVs, no matter how much it has actually been flogging its EV goals publicly. Their production is actually quite anemic because they're really focusing on their popular gas powered trucks and SUVs to actually finance this transition. So they're putting a lot more resources than they actually publicly will actually state behind their gas powered cars because they are so profitable while kind of tiptoeing around the EV issue publicly and politically because they have to make these cars and then they are trying to stay cozy with the politicians so they don't want to trash the EVs, but they realize what's going on here. And they realize that there are going to be jobs that they're going to have to cut. I mean, the Stellantis announced last year, I think in December, around 30,000 job layoffs in order to finance the EV transition. But they also realize that they're going to need subsidies from the government and hence why they're very cautious in their public statements, because they know that they need the government's support here in order to finance this transition, that they're not going to be able to do it on their own, even with all their gas powered car profits. Of course, the subsidies here, Kim, are so broad and so spread across various elements of the green energy so-called transition, that they're going to all kinds of companies. It's really quite extraordinary. ExxonMobil, for example, oil and gas company of historic note, is uh, going to invest, I guess is the word, $7 billion in a variety of technologies, including carbon capture, which when it proves to be economic, it will be the first time, but they're going to try to invest in that. And of course, I mean, it may or may not work. We don't know. I remember the company, Southern Company, invested hundreds of uh, millions of dollars in a carbon capture technology at its Kemper plant, and that didn't work out. It had to take a giant write off. Maybe this will be the time that it hits the sweet spot. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But the economic point is that that $7 billion that isn't invested in something else, oil and gas. And that's the unseen when it comes to subsidies, economic impact, because you can see the impact immediately when it comes to, okay, that factory is going to be built. There's groundbreaking over there. You got a battery factory there and a carbon capture plant here, but you don't know down the road whether they'll make it. And then what didn't get created because of that politically directed investment? And Paul, this is why the 
administration is so careful to use the word invest. We're investing in the future because the real words that we should be using when we talk about this exercise are corporate welfare, which is something that Americans by and large do not like, but also government picking winners and losers. And a lot of us are old enough to remember the Obama stimulus, which was also an exercise in government picking winners and losers. And what we learned from that is that whenever the government goes down that road, they mainly pick losers. Solyndra, for instance. And you really hit on the huge point, which is Yeah, you can have a temporary boost in spending, and we are seeing that. We're seeing a boost in public works spending and conservation and development spending, some highways because of the highway bill. But the question that has to be answered is, would there be a more productive use of that money if businesses were making the decisions themselves? And the real terribleness of programs like this is that there's so much money out there. The industries feel they must compete for these dollars or else lose them to their competitors. And that is driving them to make decisions, as you know, that are not sensible in any way, that are not actually based on what do consumers want, what's our long-term business plan, but these short-term decisions about how can you grab the money. And that's just straight up misallocation of capital. And so you have to kind of imagine what could be versus what is happening. And then that's before you factor in the longer term consequences of this, whether it's on potentiality for higher taxes to finance this, the borrowing costs for the government, and where we end up lagging because investment didn't go where it potentially should have gone if the right people were making the decisions. (laughs) 